Well, we're in this uh, short uh, three-week series uh, on marriage called Tighten the Knot. And last week, if you were with us, uh, uh, we talked about Paul's exhortation uh, for husbands to love their wives as Christ loves the church. It was, uh, you know, that's a, it's a great challenge for all of us uh, men who are, who are husbands and who are married. And also to love their wives as, as Christ loved the church and for women to respect uh, their husbands. Uh, we talked about the fact that women run on love and men run on respect. And that Paul actually actually reminds husbands and wives to do those things. So husbands, love your wives like Jesus loves the church and women, you need to respect your husbands. And Paul reminds us that of those things um, because at times each of us probably who are married probably uh, at times fall short in doing those things, those individual things for one, for one another. Well, today I want to speak to married people because we're in a marriage series, but I also want to speak to the single people in the room today. I actually don't like um, marriage sermon series that don't address one of the largest demographics in the room. In fact, one of the largest demographics in uh, our church congregations, and that's single people. Um, so all you single people, you won't miss out today in our marriage series. Uh, I think we need to be, I think the church needs to be open and honest about marriage. Um, about our marriages. I was talking to someone last night that, and rem, that as I, I quoted the text, I quoted the, the, uh, the stat from last week that one in three marriages fail in Australia. One in three. And um, we talked about that last week and we also talked about, if you weren't with us last week, I'd encourage you to go back and maybe take a listen, watch the, the sermon on YouTube or listen to the podcast. And we, we talked about that God's grace for those people where marriage has failed, that God's grace is indeed sufficient enough for them and uh, also for a fresh start. So if you missed that, I encourage you to, to, to take, take another listen at that. But I, I really do believe church, churches need to be talking about marriage more. Because um, I think the stats are just the, about the same in the church these days. If we ever hope to have healthy marriages and thus in turn healthy churches. I actually heard a story one day uh, in the Garden of Eden. Um, Eve became oh, very suspicious of Adam. She became very suspicious of Adam and she accused him of being with Adam other women. I mean, unbelievable. And Adam said, what? Eve? What, what are you talking about? You're the only woman on the whole of the planet. You're the only, the only woman in the garden. You're the only, the only woman that exists. Eve, it's just you. What are you talking about? Well, that night, Adam was asleep and Suddenly he was awakened to find Eve picking at his ribs. And he said, Eve, Eve, what are you doing? He said, I'm just counting your ribs. <laughs> it was funnier than that. I reckon it was funnier than that, but anyway. Um, last week's jokes were better, yeah. Hey, the text for today is this. Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 to 6. Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let no one separate. The context of these verses is that Jesus has been a approached by a group of Pharisees who actually asked Jesus in verse 3, uh, some Pharisees came to him to test him, which happened quite regularly, and they asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Historically, Moses had 
made the reluctant decision to control divorce in to try and control divorce in its most hideous uh, excesses, where a male was allowed to divorce his wife on the most most trivi- trivial matters, like he didn't didn't like her cooking. A man, do you know that a man could even do so? Uh, Um, divorce his wife whilst he was drunk, all he had to do was write a certificate of divorce and he had to wait until he was sober the next morning. Um, The the, the issue behind, so it wasn't really great in these patriarchal uh, cultures um, for women. And the, the issue here behind the Pharisees' question was getting at two Jewish schools of thought uh, on the on the different interpretations of the merits of divorce based on the words something indecent, which was obviously always open to and for abuse. The first school, the first Jewish school, it was a school called Shammai, S H A W M A I, and they interpreted those words, something indecent, that Jewish school interpreted it as adultery. And that would line up with Jesus' words. Uh, in fact, that that's one of the reasons that Jesus permitted divorce. You know, like obviously, God's grace can even heal that. I've, I've seen that. But Jesus does speak to that as a reason, right? So that was the Jewish school of Shammai. That's what they believe. And then there's this other Jewish school um, called... Hillel, H-I-L-L-E-L, who saw it actually, these two words of something indecent as a reason to divorce your wife, um, as, as a multitude of much, much, much lesser serious things, like she's a bad cook. Like, I'm serious. She's a bad cook. The, these religious guys, these religious guys, these Pharisees, were trying to get Jesus to side with either the Jewish school of Shammai or the Jewish school of Hillel, right? Um, in terms, they wanted to find out this, is when it comes to sex ethics, is Jesus a conservative of li- or liberal? But Jesus refuses to be drawn into their religious antics and their religious games and instead and, and, and instead of they want him to primarily talk about divorce, Jesus doesn't do that. But he goes, he goes behind all that and goes back to the very pers- purpose of marriage himself. Jesus decides to not get involved in their games, but he, give, he goes back to the maker's original instructions. And Jesus says, haven't you read... He replied that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female. And we, I read that and you hear that. And I know that there are some parts of the Christian, Christian church that will disagree with what I'm about to say. But, but I believe that marriage is meant to be complementary. God made, made them male and female. Um. Despite what the world says, the, the, you know, it, it's, it is not a unisex world. Despite what you see on TV, there are obvious differences between male and female, and yet an obvious complementarity. Um, I'm a complementarian when it comes to marriage. I, I would be, or I wouldn't be married to my wife much for very long. I'll tell you that very much now. But I'm, but I'm complementarian when it comes to marriage, not egalitarian. What I mean is that men don't rule over and be the boss in marriage. I'm not saying that men aren't spiritual leaders or, or anything. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that men don't rule over women in marriage and say, and misquote, I'm the head and I'm the boss and all that kind of stuff. That's not me. Now, I know that some people, some uh, people in um, some Christian circles will theologically disagree with me on that. But, but I just want to let you know I'm complementary, not egalitarian. Does that make sense? Um, and 
And, yeah, and I said, some people will disagree with me theologically, and that's okay. Uh, but what we do learn about this from Jesus' words and from when he's quoting from Genesis here is that marriage is permanent, right? When I don't, marriage is permanent. For anyone who's got a, an ounce of a Christian worldview knows that marriage, from the Bible perspective, is, is permanent. Permanence is God's intention. The two will become one flesh. The two will become one flesh. And the bonding is meant to provide a permanent relationship that will not be broken by anything indecent, whether interpreted by the school of Shammai or the school of Hillel. Marriage is intended to be permanent and any deviation from that is a deviation away from God's purpose. So there's this definite permanence to marriage. There is an exclusiveness to marriage. Um, the man is united to his wife. He becomes one flesh with her. He becomes one flesh with her because sex is a glue. Sex is glue. That's why sex is exclusive to marriage because you can't go around being glued to this person and that person, right? You can't go around being glued to all these different people. Why? Because sex is a sex is a glue. No way, no way is a husband or wife allowed to have a little flutter on the side. Because each is now pledged to find fulfillment in one another and no other. There is this oneness to marriage that is unique amongst all other relationships. In fact, it's a union that is spiritual, but also physical. Uh, this sexual union of a married couple uh, is an important part, the sexual union, the glue. However, I mean, a married couple becomes one in many, many other ways um, that can be seen outside their sexual union, outside their... their their glue, the, 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 the one flesh. I mean, let's just take the issue of finances for a moment. In many cases, a, a married couple is going to have a mortgage together, um, share a bank account together, even file tax file, um, tax returns jointly. Because why? Because their household is now combined. The government wants to know about my income and my wife's income. They want to know about the two. Why? Because we're one, we're combined. I've got to tell you, I always worry when I hear that married couples have separate bank accounts. Now, I don't mean you got, I'm not, you know what I'm trying to say, but the real main, they're separate. Your money is your money and my money is my money and neither shall the two meet. I worry about that. And I worry about that because it goes against the oneness of what it is. It, it doesn't reflect the reality of what has happened when you get married. You become one. Um, my sister and her husband have separate bank accounts. My sister. Yeah, I've told her, you know, like, I, you know, like, it's just like, it's, there's something wrong with it. There's something not right with it. If you disagree, well, let's just get over it. But um, our oneness is a married couple. I tell you, my, well, Alison has uh, on my phone, I can see her calendar and she can see my schedule. Um, we see each other's schedules. We share schedules with one another because I've got to know who I've got to pick up and when I've got to pick it up. We share similar goals. Um, we share the things we own. I mean, the oneness is even simply seen in the tradition um, of sharing the same last name. If they have children, this oneness is also seen in this little being that they have produced together. Uh, that oneness is seen, isn't it? Because of the, the, they, of, they share their, our DNA. The child is a perfect representation of the oneness that the married couple has. Marriage, according to Scripture, is permanent, exclusive, and also nuclear. Uh, and I don't mean radioactive, even though sometimes it could be. Um, I'm talking about nuclear in the definition of it being central or the nucleus or cell 
of something. And what is the nucleus, according to Genesis and Jesus' words in Matthew's gospel when it comes to talking about marriage? Well, it's this. What's the, what's the cell? What's the nucleus of, of that? Well, it's this. Leaving as well as cleaving. Leaving as well as cleaving. A successful marriage begins with leaving. I mean, I know I'm talking to the choir here this morning, um, but it's good to be reminded a successful marriage begins with leaving. In effect, you leave all other relationships. The closest relationship outside of marriage that is specified in Genesis chapter 2.25, it's implying that if necessary, leaving your father and mother. That's probably the closest relationship outside the, 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 the spouse. And it's implying that it's necessary to leave mum and dad. You leave mother and father. And if that's, if that's said that's necessary, then it's certainly necessary to, to cut other ties as well where you need to. That the other ties must be broken, changed or left behind. And that doesn't mean that when you get married that you, you're no longer a son or daughter or a sibling. Of course you are. But what it does mean is that you have a new primary responsibility and that is to your spouse. I always say at a wedding ceremony, everyone, that a brand new family is about to be born today. A brand new family is about to be, about to be born. Severance, according to Jesus, is essential for a successful marriage. And I and a number of times I do prepare and rich with young couples and, and that, there's, that this is an issue. That's the main issue that we've got to deal with. You know, um, um, son, you, mum can no longer do your ironing. You take in your ironing bag over to mum to do your ironing when you know, they, 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 there's got to be some severance here. Uh, um, it's maybe not healthy, uh, but there's, there's got to be some uh, leaving and I think that the, men, the reason that many marriages struggle in those early days is because they haven't learned, they haven't, they haven't yet cleaved because no, there's, there hasn't been a leaving first. Um, to sever that tie, to sever, to sever that high and emotionally dependent strings that once to your parents two parents, that once provided security, protection, and financial assistance. Financial assistance. Financial assistance, yes, yes. That will be looking forward to that one day. Um, but, uh, yes. So, 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 so there you go. So God mentions this first because before he mentions, he mentions leaving before he mentions cleaving. So for this man, reason, a man will leave his mother and father and be united to his wife and the two will become flesh. And uh, I think uh, I say to the younger men who one day will get, maybe here in this room who are getting married and particularly the next service, brothers, if you can't cleave, you can't cleave if you don't leave. You can't cleave if you don't leave and, and uh, there's no cleaving if there's no leaving. And the reason that many marriages struggle in these early days is because you haven't yet cleaved to what you've got. And, and, I, and sometimes, and I, sometimes you haven't cleaved to what you've got because you haven't left what you had. You haven't left what you had. You know, pastor, we're not cleaving. That's right, because somebody's not leaving. And you see that reality in that God has given us marriage. Do you know that God has given the reason that you're married? Because I said last week, there's no marriage in heaven. I hate to blow your bubble. There's no marriage in heaven. So enjoy it while you can. Um, but here's the thing: God, God gives us marriage. Why? What's one of the primary ways that God what reasons why God gives us marriage? To prepare you for eternity. Because here's the thing: eternity's coming. I mean, it's one step closer, one day closer today. God has got you in a marriage to prepare you for eternity. See, because God's ultimate intention for your life is to make you a worshipper, is to turn you into a worshipper, to worship God. And, you know, you, you, you can't worship God if you can't lay your life down. You can't follow Jesus 
if you can't lay your life down. And you, can't, and you can't have a successful marriage until you learn to lay your life down and leave things behind. And God is, because life's about leaving things behind. Ultimately, life is all about loss. It is. We lose things. As you get older, I'm not, as you get older, do you not lose things? God is not, I mean, lose things, like lose me at the keys. We lose things all the time. God is, because he's preparing, he's detached from this world, he's preparing us for eternity. You leave your mother and father. Here, here's how it works, this marriage and to eternity. God wants, in marriage, he wants to teach you, you leave your father and mother behind, you leave your original source of flesh to cleave to marriage just in the same way that you leave your fleshly desires of your old creation to embrace the Holy Spirit and his regenerating power. In order to do that, you've got to lay down your life on both accounts. So if, if people aren't willing to die to past relationships, habits of spending, selfish attitudes... They have no business being in a marriage. And I think this leave, leaving and cleaving, I think it's sound advice for parents. For anyone here whose kids haven't been married yet or have been newly married, I think it's sound advice for parents to heed, just as much for those getting married. Release your child because it's the best wedding gift you can give them. That's why I like to include both sets of parents in a wedding ceremony for a parent, parental blessing. Leave, cleave, sever, and bond. There was this... Pro- I've got another story for you. Let's see if this one works. Um, there was a prospective father-in-law. Um, the prospective father-in-law asked, um, young man, can you support a family? And well, the surprised groom-to-be replied, well, no, I was just planning on supporting... Your daughter, the rest of you will have to fend for yourselves. <laughs> so, so many uh, people look at marriage like marriage in our world today, marriage till, marriage till disagreement do us part. But not, in, but not in God's original plan. And, you know, I'm very sensitive of, you know, people who've had marriage breakdowns in the room today, and I get that, I understand that, but I still, got to, I still preach the original intentions I've got to do that because that's his plan, right? It's death till us part. You know, in the three regular, you remember those, maybe we should have another one, another church picnic. You know, when we had the church picnic, the volunteers thing, and we, and you know, the good old fashioned church picnic where you have the three legged race. You know, the three, you know, the three legged, three legged race, you and your partner are connected together by your, your inside legs, and then thus you're only having obviously three legs working and that's what's called the three-legged race um but the point of the race is to become the point of the three-legged race is to make you become like one person working together uh to make it to the finish line without falling over it's the same in a marriage running the race of life together as one entity and then matthew chapter 19 verses 10 to 11 say this following on the disciples said to him the disciples said to jesus If this is the situation, Jesus, between a husband and a wife, it is better not to marry. Jesus replied, not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it has been given. Interesting passage of scripture there by Jesus. Marriage is not for everyone. Marriage is not for everyone. That is the plain meaning of those verses. Marriage is not for everyone. And I want to take the rest of this message um, to speak to those who are single amongst us today. Uh, And it's no secret that there are many Christians, and uh, I know that there are um, widows amongst us today, and um, I know that God's grace is sufficient for you during these times, but I I, I just want to speak to to the single people in the room because uh, I think it's no secret that many, there are many Christians, there's some who don't, but there are many Christians who struggle with this idea of being content while single. That Christians are, that Christians are sometimes part of this subculture 
who have elevated the role of marriage as something to be desired above all. That when you get married, you've hit the pinnacle. Like you've, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, we, and we sort of elevate marriage uh, as the pinnacle above, above, above everything else to be desired. And many younger Christians, uh, and I've spoken to people even in this church who have, uh, in, have been in turmoil um, because waiting um, to, to find their, their mate and, and, and found themselves in, in, in turmoil, emotional turmoil, due to spending so much time hoping that God would send them a spouse. And I get that. I really do. I get that. And uh, it's easy for me to say that as a married person. But, but I, think that, I think that's normal and understandable. I think the problem, church, comes when we start thinking that life doesn't start until you find a mate. Now, I know some of you here are going, but I've gone long past that. But there are people in our churches who, who actually feel that way, that life doesn't start until they actually find that special somebody. They find that mate. And we know that that's, you know, that, that, that's certainly not, not, not true. Um, and then it only comes worse for some of these single people when they're scrolling through social media you know, and comparing their single lives to those who are married. Or it's like that movie... Um, I don't know if you've ever seen it, called 27 Dresses, where you're always the bridesmaid and never the bride. Um, you see people moving into new seasons of life. And as much as we know that partnership and marriage is a good thing to be desired, I just want to say today, it, 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 it doesn't need to be desired above all. The Lord has a purpose for everyone in every season of life, including, including singleness. So suppose that you are single and you hope to be married someday. What should you do? Well, this applies for boyfriends and girlfriends also. Here's the marriage math again that I... It's different from last Sunday, if you are here last Sunday, but here's the marriage math again. Write it down um, um, and memorise it. I will seek the one whilst I wait for my two. I will seek the one whilst I wait for my two. Last week's marriage math was something along, I will, I will seek the one with my two, something like that. But it's really important that I will, I will seek the one whilst I wait for my two. Uh, if you're not married and you follow Christ then, and you're single, then above anything else, you should honour God. That's the first thing you should do. You should love him. You should seek him. You should seek the one and you should live by his spirit. You should structure your life in such a way that everything that you do brings glory to God in your singleness. Don't seek a spouse. Seek God first. And when you actually do that, according to Matthew chapter 6, 33, God will give you everything that you need. So church, we need to give marriage its due but we must be wary of elevating it beyond God's intentions. I mean, God said that marriage is good. He never said it's essential. God said marriage is good. He never said it's essential. Marriage, whilst important, is not essential for one's spiritual development at all. In fact, if we take an honest look this morning um, at the Apostle Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 7, where he praises the calling of singleness, citing its advantages for the Christian journey. What are the advantages of uh, singleness? Well, what, namely, one's ability to focus first and foremost on God, not a spouse. Because Paul affirms the different set of callings and gifts that the Lord places on, on each of our lives that as followers of Christ, we must appreciate and honour the unmarried members of our ch in our church communities. I'm going to say this again, that we should honour and respect and appreciate the unmarried members of our church communities, thanking God for them and for their service and for their dedication towards him. You see, one way that singleness can be such a fruitful thing is because of the freedom. Oh, because of the freedom. Because of the freedom. Can I talk about that for a moment? Um, uh, a single person can say, well, can, can I afford to buy that new car? Well, of course I can. I don't have to pay school fees. <coughs> um, 
Can I commit to that overseas missions trip? Well, yes, I can. I don't need to worry about it conflicting with my spouse's schedule. I have no spouse. I'm on my own clock. Um, I have a king-sized bed. And better still, I don't have a spouse that snores. Praise God. 1 Corinthians 7, 32 to 35 says this. this. Look at this. I would like you to be free from concern. <laughs> I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. <laughs> but a married man is concerned about the things of this world, how he can please his wife, and his interests are divided. <laughs> I'll give you a testimony on that. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs, her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. <laughs> uh, yes. Paul associates the married life with a life of necessary worries and obligations. Paul says, I'd like you to be free of concern. Are there any married people here today who'd like to give a testimony about the worries and concerns of uh, being married at times? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'd like you to be free of concern. Um, you know, <laughs> worries and concerns, yeah, yeah. Listen, listen, take a look at my bank account. Have a look at my bank account in this season of life and my grey hair if you want to know about the concerns. But for the unmarried person, Paul is saying, wow, you have fewer complications, fewer problems, so you can go more freely about the work of the Lord. Now, this is not saying that married people cannot do the work of the Lord, because obviously we do. Or that single people have unlimited free time. But the two relationships, leave and cleave, thing, statuses, Mark a stark contrast in priorities, do they not, married people? There will always be things that we can do as married people that glorify God, that serve his people and help us grow in Christ. But married people, we, got to, we must take into consideration our spouses, children, finances and obligations into account on a regular, daily basis. Sure, single people who are single here, you have worries and you have different focuses. But Paul's saying that you can, you can channel them all into the focus of serving the Lord with everything that you have without responsibilities tied to a husband or a wife. I think this is the... We, I put on the back of the sermon notes, what's my one thing? What does it say? My one thing is, my one thing is, because every time you hear a sermon every week, I know that next week you sometimes will forget what was preached on, but we're just asking you to maybe just write down one thing. What's your one thing? What's the one thing? And that's going to be on the back of those sermon notes going forward. We just want you to remember one thing, apply one thing. And this is the one big thing from this sermon today. Here it is. We need to wholeheartedly embrace today that God uses both single and married people for his glory. That singleness is a gift and we must honour it the same way as we do marriage. Amen? That's what we need to do. And so I'm going to ask, over time a bit, but it's okay, I'm going to ask all the single people uh, in the room here today um, to stand and I'm going to pray. We prayed for the married people last week and uh, I'm going to ask you to stand if you feel comfortable to stand and I'm going to pray for you today. Um, Next service, I'll pray for teenagers and young adults as well. Um, but if you feel comfortable to stand, do that right now because I'm going to pray for you right now. Let's, we, thank you. Father God, I just want to just uh, today, we just thank you for your word. And I thank you, Father, uh, that you have uh, a, a plan and a purpose, Lord, uh, for people in all seasons of life, including singleness and, and married people. And Lord, I just pray for those who are standing right here now. Lord, um, maybe, maybe some of them, Lord, are, 
uh, they are waiting for a partner, a spouse. Um, Lord, I pray that as they wait, Lord God, that you would, um, yeah, that Father God, that they will continue to seek you, seek the one as they wait for their, their, their two. But Lord God, um, maybe there's some standing right now, Lord God, who have actually made the decision to embrace singleness. And Lord, <coughs> excuse me, Lord, would you forgive the church? Forgive us for times when we've elevated marriage above what it needs to be and we've isolated um, singleness and single people. So I pray for the singles amongst us today. And Lord, I thank you for them. And Lord, as I look at them today, I just thank you for the way that they diligently serve your church. Lord, that they, that they, are, for, they have different priorities, no doubt. But Lord, they're free from some of the concerns that Paul has mentioned here today. Lord, would you bless them? Lord, I pray, Father God, I thank you for their, for their maturity and I thank you for their contentness in who you've created them to be and who they are as people and their season in life. And uh, so, Lord God, I just want to honour them today and we thank you for them in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you.